You're listening to the Australian Hunting and Beyond podcast with Matt. Where we talk about hunting, shooting, fishing, camping, and everything else that the great outdoors has to offer. Let's get into it. All right, welcome back, guys. Tonight, we are talking to Rick Bickle, who has started a pretty popular New South Wales Samba hunting page, and he's also just come back from the Vic High Country, which I can't wait to hear about what happened down there. Rick, thanks for joining us on the show, mate. No, thanks for having me, mate. Been been a bit of a ride with the, the Samba's page, and uh, it's been good. No, it's pretty popular, and uh, it's good to get on, get on a podcast and talk about it mate it has i jumped on board very early in the piece and it's been really good to see it grow and it's pretty rewarding like so i'm the admin for fellow deer hunters of australia and yeah it's a good page it's grown rapidly i didn't start the page but i took over it um as i was like on there and and the bloke who was running it asked me to take over it just couldn't dedicate the time and since then it's it's just really become quite popular it's really good to see people sharing in a positive manner and talking like you do get a little bit of criticism here and there, but I mean, some of these Always. pages are really good. Yeah. Yeah. I've found, um, I'm trying to keep it clean, trying to keep it sort of very ethical. We had a few issues early on with a couple of posts and I'm just, um, it's a bit different to the Victorian hunters because they're all about Samba. Um, and Samba aren't that well known to be in New South Wales, but they are growing and the, and the genetics are really good. The feed they're on is really good. So we're getting to see some really quality animals coming coming through the page there's some really big samba coming up so it's good really good i have noticed that some of the pictures there's some stonkers on there you just i'm sitting there going how good are some of these you know they're on fire yeah even um the way i come about it was i I traveled to victoria a fair bit down the mansfield area jemison high country and i lost a big samba years ago and it just haunted me haunted me for a long time and then I managed to pick up a nice little property a few hours from Sydney. I had a lot of rooster on it and um, but I managed to take my biggest samba two hours from Sydney. It's just how things happen. I wasn't expecting it. It just popped up and I wasn't going to let it go and then after that, once I got that first samba on the ground, I've been hooked. I've been hooked for a long time but that thing just increased my want to continue hunting because I find them the most challenging. I reckon they're the best. I'm not at that level yet by any stretch yep. of the imagination. I've only just bagged my first deer. So um, speaking of Rusa, it was a Rusa. So yep. I was pretty excited about that because it's uh, it's been a couple of years coming. So yep. pretty damn happy uh, to the point I don't didn't really take too many photos. So haven't gone into details on the podcast yet. I know a few people have been messaging and stirring me up over it saying they want to hear it, but uh, I really want to get the bloke who I was with on for the whole journey to, to come on. So that is yeah. coming. But from everything that I hear, talk to mates about, they just are such an incredible animal and everybody says how difficult they are. I can understand the allure because it's that additional challenge where you may not get that with some of the other deer species here. Yeah, 100%. Uh, whether you're hunting them on fringe country um, or whether you're hunting them in the thick stuff, they just have this sixth sense. They just know something's not right. How they react to it is depends on the pressure, I think, in the areas. And there's, there's just something about them. They're just next level. And this, for such a big animal, they can just disappear without sound. It's like, where the hell did that thing go? With those big antlers trying to get through thick stuff, it's like, where did it go? Where did it disappear to? Do you think it's the evolution that they've grown up being hunted by tigers, that tigers are stealthy bloody animal to have evolved around that predator? Yeah, you have to be like for like sort of thing, don't you? Yeah, well, you can sort of – because the chittle and the rooster come from similar areas, but I think the rooster, uh, the samba, are just – they 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 must have been hunted heavily by by the tiger, must have been targeted a lot by them because they're switched on. And they they know they don't have any real sort of – predators in Australia than the wild dogs and us, but they're still so switched on. They haven't lost any of that genetic makeup that just makes them next level prey. I really, I can't talk enough about them. I just love, I love everything about them. It's funny. I've got a couple of good mates that they're the same. Like they have some really quality fallow access blocks and they don't really chase fallow. They'll use them to, you know, stop the freezer. 
but it is all about chasing Samba and that yeah. challenge. And then also the difficulty of such a large animal of being able to pack out the amount of meat you get. But I sort of sit there and go, I've been on a couple where people have got deer and yeah. you see the difference in size between a fallow and, you know, even my rooster, there was a, it was a little bit bigger than a fallow. But then you go to yep. a Samba again and, man, that's that's next level pack outs. That's next level amount of meat that you're dealing with and an animal yeah. just moving it around and and the country that a lot of people hunt them in, in that steep country. Man, it just – you almost have to be a bit of a sucker for punishment to be wanting to chase them. Oh, and you just keep going back. That's the thing about them. Whether or not you harvest one or whether you do, you back it there. No matter how sore you are, you're just like, I'm not coming back here ever again. A couple of days later, you're like, I'm planning my next trip. Where am I going? I've got to work these guys out again. Uh, yeah, there's something about them. But they are, they are a next level big animal. Like a fellow, you can sometimes, a young fellow, you could sort of pack it out in one go if, you, if you're smart about it. Um, or maybe two goes with a, with a Samby. You're four or five trips. Easy. Easy. With one back leg and maybe the back straps is using my first run out. Then the second back, back leg. Then whether or not depending on how far I've had to walk it out and how hard the terrain is, it might be another leg, another trip for each of the other legs. And then if you're taking the head as well, yeah, it's, it's a big effort. It's a big effort. That sounds attractive to me. I'm dying to get down to the Vic High country because I do love the challenge side of it. For me, yep. just going up and down a mountain, seeing places that no one has been to potentially or, or haven't been in years, that – has this just epic sort of challenge for me to to want to explore that and get out there. So yeah. I'm definitely keen to get down to Vic. How was your latest trip down there? Um, it was it was a first real test of a of a of a decent length solo pack hunt. Um, I'm testing some gear for New Zealand, so it was hot, it was windy, it was some very shaly terrain. So you had to be switched on the whole time. You got tired real quickly. You had to make sure you're hydrated a lot. I was losing a lot of sweat just walking up and down through the elevations, getting down to the water source each day, spending some time down there. Because me, if I was in 30 degree heat, I don't, I don't want to be up in the higher stuff in the wind, in the sun. I want to be down in the cooler sort of catchments. I found some really good sign. Uh, I think I was just a couple of weeks late. So for the area, from my experience. The rut is usually probably about a month, three weeks previous to when I was down there. I was down there a week or so ago, and I think I've just missed it. There's a lot of fresh sign, a lot of preach trees, still mud on the trees. They've had a lot of rain as well, so plenty of water around, plenty of really good feed down at the bottom of the catchments, but I think I just missed it by a couple of weeks. But it's a catchment that I haven't hunted, two catchments a little further north from where I regular haunts that I've done with um, – couple of good friends that live down in Mansfield um, but it's somewhere that I really want to get back there sort of the right time of the year but I don't think it'll work next year because I've got New Zealand whether or not I try and get in there a bit early and try and get a velvet samba because by far that's the best eating meat that I've ever had is a velvet samba but yeah it, it was rewarding in the fact that I'd come out four days later I wasn't sort of over it I wanted to stay in there, but I had to get, it was a Sunday, I had to get home, I had to go back to work, <laughs> got all those duties. But yeah, I probably could have stayed in there another two days with my provisions that I had. Uh, I went a little bit overboard just to make sure I was safe. So yeah, no, it's very, it's, it wasn't a lo loss at all. It was very much some, gained some really good country that I know that are going to be some deer in there at the right time of year. So no, it's good, really good. So, look, on that, I'm a tech head. I love yeah. gear and I love hearing and Me learning too. about all different types of gear. What were you running over there or testing out for New Zealand in the trip? Uh, okay, it's a new pack. Uh, I went with a QEU Pro Icon 7200 pack. I've been running Hunter's Element gear most of the last couple of years. I've tried, I've tried a bit of Stone Glacier gear this trip. Um, still got some QEU gear. I've just went a bit nuts on the QEU cyber sale today. Brett and I, who I'm going to New Zealand with, went a bit nuts on that. So hopefully um, that'll keep me happy for a little while. In regards to technology, I upgraded my camera. Um, I dumped the spotting scope. I've gone with the Nikon P1000 Coolpix. So it's massive zoom on it. Um, I've teamed it up with the Rode uh, microphone. 
um, and that gives you 125 times zoom and then you've got your digital zoom on top of that. And I thought I'd, instead of carrying around a new mirrorless camera, the spotting scope, extra weight, extra money, I found this this item and I tested it out a fair bit and it's I think it's going to be very beneficial because you can zoom right in, you can actually record what you're doing, you're not fumbling around trying to connect your camera to your spotting scope. I wear it on my hip, so I've got a nice little bag for it. I can wear it on my hip, pull it out straight away. The tripod I ran on it was a Manfredo Carbon B3, I think it is, which is nice and light, plenty of good features on it. And I had the, uh, I think it's the Stay Rest uh, rifle mount that I can actually put on. I had a tracking pole that has a camera attachment on the top. They can actually put the gun rest in and use that as a stable rest if um, you didn't have a tree or anything to sort of rest on or you pack. Um, in regards to electronics, I run the Garmin 66i. So really safe bit of equipment. It's got your PLB, it's got your inReach, uh, it's got your downloadable weather app as well. So you can always, if you don't have any signal, I wasn't too bad. I had signal most of the place back at camp, um, but it's just one of those things that if you don't have any signal, you can always tell your missus where you are or your loved ones. Um, you've got that added feature of being able to talk to other people within reach. If your phone goes flat, you still can use your, uh, the Garmin, the 66i, as opposed just to the standalone in reach or even like the New Zilo and the Zilo, whatever they are. They don't have that function. You have to have the actual charge in your phone. So, um, what other tech did I run? I'm running a new Beretta BRX1. Usually I run a 300 WSM ticker for Samba or a 338. Um, I've got the 308 Beretta BRX1 running the Barnes TDS X uh, 168 grainers. And they're tried and tested already on a Sambra I shot a couple of weeks before, a nice 27 incher. I've got back about 167 grams, uh, grains of weight back on that projectile out of 168. So, and I'm running the Swarovski Z5, I think it's a 2.4 to 12 by 50 scope illuminator reticle it's got beautiful uh, ballistic turret the set pins nice little setup i thought about taking new zealand but i think i need that extra range with the 300 wsm i could probably i can get the converted barrels for the for the beretta brx1 which is a cool little little um, addition to that to that rifle along with that changing of the hands i went with the, the beretta because my son's about to get his uh, junior firearms license and he looks like he's going to be a right hander so i'm a lefty so it's good to be able to have that ability to be able to change the handle just to make it easier on him. I haven't had much to do with the Beretta. I have heard the Hunters Campfire boys talking about it because they were running them for a little bit. Is yep. that the one with the straight pull as opposed to your normal bolt? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. My first straight pull rifle. And I was a bit hesitant when I first took it to the range because I was, I was babying it through the cycles and it was sort of jamming a little bit. So I spoke to Tony from uh, Beretta and he said, just ram it. He goes, that's what they're designed to do, quick cycles. And I got it out in the field and I gave it a few good quick rounds and cycled through it and it's beautiful. It's a really nice action on it. They were talking about how it was a little loud compared to your traditional sort of bolts when you're yeah. cycling it. They were talking about the differences between, you know, having a, a round in the chamber when you're hunting and not because of sort of that and that it was a little bit tricky. Did you find that there's a bit noisier than... Like your ticker? Yeah, it is because with a with a normal bolt action, as you know, you can sort of put your finger on the on the cartridge as it comes up through the the feeder. I found the safety system on the bread is a little bit better than most bolt actions. It's got a three stage safety system on it, um, so I know as most guys are opposed to walking around with a, a round in the chamber, but if you're samba hunting, it's a lot of times you do. A lot of guys have it half cocked, have the bolt half cocked with the cartridge in the chamber but i find the three stage safety on the beretta it's a good good system um, you can either have it in completely locked out where you can't move the bolt uh, you can have it with the round in the chamber and locked or you can have it in firing system as well so it is a little noisy as it compared to a bolt action but i think the pros that go along with it being able to cycle a lot quicker than a than a normal bolt action with Samba, it could be a good thing. So. Yeah, cool.
So you, that trekking pole, I know that you can get from BCF where you just are able to screw out and then put your yoke on top or your yeah. – um, I've got bino, so basically like a platform with straps so I can hook my binos up to them as well. They're pretty handy, yeah. especially in steeper country. I know I've used a lot of hiking yeah. poles in a lot, a lot of hiking, not so much hunting, but they are very handy. And I, I can't remember the stat off the top of my head, but – Someone was saying if you've got a if you've got your pack on and you're using hiking poles correctly, it can yeah. take up to seventy five percent of the felt weight out of the pack when you're hiking. Don't quote me on that. It's some significant amount. It's really right up there. I tend to agree with that hundred percent, especially with the steep stuff. You can just take that little bit of instead of using all your leg power to balance yourself and control the weight of that pack, you've got an extra leg or an extra two legs to sort of distribute that weight um, and especially if you're in the hilly stuff or trying to contour across some shaly sort of ground you need that extra bit of support 100% agree with that I, I was just running a one from a backpack um, an extendable carbon fiber one with the yoke on top but it also had a nice round ball on the top so you could actually put weight on top of it instead of just actually having the handle and trying to use the handle yeah um, which I found another nice little feature as well Mate, some of the carbon fiber gear now is ridiculous. Like when I started hiking, God, that's way too long ago. I'm really starting to show my age. But that would have been 20 plus years ago now. The gear you've got now is just so unbelievably good. Yeah. It's hard to imagine sort of casting back to being 20 years ago and, and the technology in different bits of gear compared yeah. to now. It's just, it's it's a new level. It's amazing. Yeah, and we've got such a better range now. Like you don't need to go out and spend every bit of coin that you've got in the bank to get a decent sort of setup to get you out in the bush. Like you can start getting stupid. Like we're getting to a point now where it's all ultralight stuff. We've tested some other gear. And so those other, it's losing that 50, 80, 100 grams off each item. It sort of adds up at the end of the pack. Like I, I think my pack, bino harness and rifle, I was at about 28 kilos. So I was pretty heavy. I can reduce a fair bit of that out of that, um, but I was I was I wanted to travel comfortable. I knew I didn't have to track in too much after I was dropped off. I had about a as the crow flies about a four k trek out, but I think I ended up doing about six and a half seven k's with everything on my back, and I hunted pretty much the whole way, so I was nice and slow. But yeah, the stuff that you can get these days, if you want to go stupid and spend a lot of money, you can you can definitely do it. Oh. But you can actually get out there and get amongst it at a at a really budget rate as well. Yeah, I think that's the key. I was talking about that on the podcast the other day is that for me, you can get out there and I did that with my scope. I got a real cheap scope on my 308. Yep. It came down to it at the time. What did I want more? Did I want the PLB and to be safe or did I want yep. like a, a more high-end scope? And for me, it was the safety element. I can always yep. upgrade the scope, but I can't if I'm dead. So for me, that that's the that was the first element, and that's sort of what I tell people that, you know, my advice. And I'm by no means an expert, but just from yeah. when you're putting yourself out there in a situation, you want to do so as safely as possible because yeah. you want to come home at the end of the day. And then on top of that, you can upgrade your gear later. Like it's yeah. not that hard to do. Just get out there, get your stuff, and then slowly add on, find out what you'd like and what you don't like. I've gone through heaps of that. I've found things yeah. that I really dislike and I've found things that I love and yeah. other people are the opposite. So it's one of those things. We all have different tastes or different likes and you just, you really yeah. got to do your research or just test it out. For some people, they will love one bit of gear. Another person will get it and they will hate it. I mean, I've got that with my Weatherby Vanguard at the moment. I'm just, I just can't get it out of my head. I'm, I, I'm not, it, I've got the ticker. And I yeah. can't stop comparing it to the ticker, which I absolutely love. And I don't like it as much. And yeah. a lot of people love the Weatherby. And they I've had people message in because the big part was the floor plate. And a couple of people have messaged me and said, hey, there's a conversion kit so you can put a magazine on it. And I was like, okay, I'm still not that, I'm still not super sold on the rifle. Yeah. I'm, I'm really leaning towards that getting another ticker in 308. You can't beat the tickers for the, for the price point. For the accuracy out of the box uh, and just the reliability. My my banger, my my one that I go to in every most of the time I go to the safe is my Ticker 300 WSM, stainless, synthetic. It's light. It gets bashed around. I've got a Bushnell Elite Tactical on top of it. Um, I think it's a two to sixteen by fifty, and I very rarely go to the range with that thing. I very clean, very rarely clean it. Um, it's just my banger. It's been to Darwin a couple of times, a couple of NT trips. I think 
before I did a trip away a couple of months ago down to one of my blocks. I actually took it out the range, but before that it did two trips to Darwin chasing buff and pigs. It did a trip to Cape York and it did probably half a dozen decent full day hunts and I pulled it out and put it on a Samba and dropped it on the, uh, put the bullet where I wanted to. And I've got other blokes who will go to the range before they go hunting every time. I'm like, you don't need to. Like, if you're confident in your setup and it works, there's no need to go to the range and keep throwing lead down. down thing. If that's what you like doing, fair enough. But you should not You should have that confidence to be able to just pull it out of the safe, chuck it on your back, and away you go. And that's what I find with that rifle is you've got to be comfortable behind the trigger, especially if you're in a, a quick um, sort of situation where you really need to get that up to your eye, pull the trigger. You need to be comfortable behind the rifle. And that's just one rifle that I'm really comfortable behind. Oh, I'm the same with my ticker. I can doesn't matter where, when I can grab it. It feels super comfy. It just feels right. Yeah. And I don't get that feeling with the weather being it. Hey, I'm not bagging out the rifle. There's a lot of people that love them. They are tried and yeah. tested and they've got a great reputation. It's just not the fit for me. So yeah. I think it's a ticker. The only other thing I am considering is the Howard Super Light because up in those mountains walking around, I've got the Maroka QR Zero. 30 sling so it's the hands-free yep. one that attaches to your ah, backpack yep, yep. uh love it because it just your hands are free plus you don't yep. really feel it, the weight of the rifle as well like it, it goes yep. through your your pack system that's the only other thing that's sort of tinkering on my mind just for that lightweight because it is a hunting gun so i'm not throwing yep. a million rounds down range so i know it will kick like a bit of a mule and i know i had troy from honker hunters on talking about he had that chasing Samba and he uh, was finding with his crooked shoulders it was just a bit too much. So he got a heavier stock to sort of tame it down a little bit. But yeah, it is one of those things, as I said, people, some people will like a certain rifle and it feels good. Other people will pick it up and just not a fan of it. And, yeah. and you know, he, he spoke about that with uh, shotguns and going out chasing ducks. He said, you, you really do have to pick it up and feel what it's like because it could be, you know, a $10,000 gun, but it might not feel right or just not suit how you like to hold or whatever it might be. Duck hunters and their shotguns are a really select group. And it is with a shotgun, you really need to shoulder the rifle to make sure it fits right. Because it's, um, you get a shotgun that doesn't fit right, you're just going to spray and you're just never going to hit a duck. Mate, it, uh, no, it is. Uh, I love, I love clay shooting. It's so much fun. Just a, a different element to it. And I, We've, I'm pretty lucky. I've got the International Shooting Centre not too far away, so I try and get yeah. over to that and, and have a crack as uh, often as possible. So how did you go? Was, so you said it was a successful trip in in sorting everything out, your four days in there. Yeah. Did you see much? Did you harvest anything? How did that did the trip play out? Um, I've seen a couple of good healthy hinds. I've seen one decent spiker, but he was probably – 700 metres away, right on last light on the second day, I think it was. I didn't harvest anything, but I was only going to sh- pull the trigger if it was a decent sand- a stag, um, unless it was on the final day walkout and it would have been turned into a meat hunt. I've got a fr- full freezer at the moment, um, so it wasn't really a meat hunt. Um, it was just more to test my mental aptitude over a few days in some decent weather and also just test a bit of gear. It would have been an added bonus if I did shoot a shoot a decent sag but wasn't meant to be i've already got a couple this year so it wasn't really a monkey i needed to get off my back so i'd class it as a successful trip just knowing the fact that I, it's some really good country i reckon i've probably seen six seven hundred rub trees in the four days easy every there was a couple of catchments there there were every tree within you could look down a a, a section of clearing and you'd see 15, 20 trees just smashed up. Then there was this yeah, walking man. track along the creek bed. It looked like the it looked like the Kokoda Trail. It had that much wear through it. Mm. Every tree on each side, and they were even smashing up decent sized gum trees. There was antler marks up gum trees, a couple of good preach trees, all still mud all over them. It's it was a really productive. I found a little dead yearling on the on the creek bed. So I don't know. That was a direct result of maybe either spotlighters that I'd seen a shitload of, or if it was a, I didn't see any dogs, didn't see any sign of dogs. So I don't think it was that, or it could have been a hunter, maybe took the mother and the poor little hind, uh, little yearling, made it down to the creek bed and just ended up dying down there with 
uh, malnutrition. All right. You touched on spotlighters there. I have heard some pretty horrific stories down there yeah. and – I did uh, remember talking to a local from down there who uh, owned a property and said it was just rampant and every night practically you'd have someone on the block or cutting fences. What? Yeah. Uh, how, how did that go down there? You were solo packing, so I'm thinking yeah. you're a fair way into the bush and yeah. you're still seeing them. Yeah, tell us about that, mate. Okay, so where it was, it was in between sort of some pretty – well-known tracks, but the the area I was in, the tracks have been bulldozed at each end, so I hadn't had any traffic down there for quite some time. First night in, I got to about, I think I got back to camp at about 9 o'clock. About 10, 15 minutes later, after I was getting my gear off, getting ready to sort of have a bit of dinner, seen two sets of lights on the ridge, which would have been, I think I ranged at about 1,100 metres away, 1,200 metres away. And then one stopped, and then a few shots rang out, and then the other ute went the other way, or the vehicle went the other way, and then I seen two more vehicles come up the ridge, and they were on both sides of me as well. So I had four vehicles within a kilometre or so, uh, 1.2k of me. The closest one got to me was on sort of my, on the eastern side of me, and he got to in about 800 metres, I reckon he would have been, Um, and he stopped and let off three rounds. And then um, they disappeared sort of about 11 o'clock. So I think in the couple of hours I were in there, probably 10, 10 odd shots I heard ring out, uh, which is pretty – and I was on the phone to my wife as well at the same time. And um, it's pretty pretty scary knowing that they're just letting off rounds willy-nilly into nothingness. So it's a real problem down in that area. Uh, where I left my vehicle is on some private property that borders the public land. And he's always had heaps of dramas with them because there's a track that runs right along his boundary. So, and they've been pretty rampant. And he said over the last last couple of a couple of years, and then just getting worse and worse. It's it's a real pain on my side because they can't really class themselves as hunters. I don't know what they're doing out there. Whether they're taking them for dog meat, whether they're doing it for fun. Uh, who knows? But um, it's it's not it's not what I. Not part of my moral sort of fibre. I've denounced poaching for as long as I yeah can remember, and um, I just I, I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't you know. I I had the I guess the privilege of talking to Andrew from down there, and he he was shot in his swag. I don't know if you've ever heard that story, yeah, I but have. man, insane. I just I don't get it. And no. as you said, just letting off rounds into the night. That's yeah. so concerning and especially down there, one of the things I do like about what Vic does is that you can just hunt. You don't have to book it in or, or the like. Yeah. But then I sort of sit there and go, anyone could be anywhere and then you've got blokes like that doing that. That's just absolutely insane to me. Like it doesn't take yeah. a lot for things to go really wrong like what happened to Andrew and that the consequences yeah. were, were dire. It's really interesting. I keep saying this. We don't I – don't, I don't know how it stops. I don't know how we fix it. Because I was talking to a property owner the other week about this and even if you find them or know them or identify them, as the landowner, you are at more – you've got more to lose, don't you? Because at the end of the day, they know where you live. Yeah. They know where you live. They obviously don't care about rules. They're breaking them. You've got to approach someone with a firearm as well. Correct. You know, like it's, (laughs) it's such a nasty situation. And you do have to think about the morals and the ethics to it because you sit there and go, okay, well, not only are they doing the wrong thing and doing that, they're putting the whole hunting community's name, they're dragging it through the mud because the first thing, you know, in the National Feral Deer Action Plan, one of the things they said about that was if you get hunters in or good trophies, poaching starts and then the illegal hunting comes in and and blah, blah, blah. And it's just ethical hunters face enough crap as it is. There's yep. always restrictions coming and, and or trying to be pushed upon us. And it's a real stain on hunting that we keep copying it. I, know, I don't know the answer. I don't know how we fix it because even if you know someone and yep. how do you prove it? Like that's an issue too. And for some people, they don't care. They're like, oh, yeah, I know people who poach and they're happy with that. They're like, yeah, I know it and they do it here. So what? And, uh, you know, I just, yeah, I don't get it. I just, that that's a me. I like it's not me and I, yeah, but the, but the next thing is how do you, 
even if you wanted to dob somebody in, how do you prove it? Yeah, exactly right. Without sort of getting within range to be able to film them or take photos or yep. get number plates. Most of them cover their number plates up anyway. They go, they stop just before they get into the, the public land and or onto the private property, cover up number plates. I spoke to someone pretty high up at ADA while it was actually happening. And he said, mate, because he's got a nice property down at Mansfield, he lives in Melbourne, but um, I'm good mates with him. And he goes, mate, this, we ring the police. They just tell you, what do we do? We don't have the resources. It happens every night. We get 30-odd phone calls just in Jemison Mansfield area every night of people out spotlighting because we just don't have the resources or the money to, to fight back. And it's it's pretty sketchy trying to get into those tracks sometimes, let alone trying to brand up someone who's just firing willy-nilly into the night. So it's a real sort of scourge on our oh, lifestyle, I'd say. I, I can't sort of, it's hard to describe what we do. Is it a sport? Is it a hobby? I call it a lifestyle, but it's all about ethics for me. I don't know how they go about chopping these heads off and putting them on their walls and saying they hunted that. Like, I just, I don't understand the moral side of it or the the bragging right side of it like who you're bragging to who's think who thinks it's cool other than the ones that are doing it as well yeah i it baffles me i i've spoken about it many a time on the podcast talking about i love the north american conservation model and a tag system and things like that i would love to see some more revenue go into conservation and also to target poaching because you made a good point there is that the police are under-resourced, especially in more rural areas. They are. Having more money to distribute, to target poaching would have to be a win. And I mean, technology nowadays, we've got thermal drones, we've got so many, I guess, tools at our disposal, but they cost. This is where I constantly talk about, you know, a, a tag system for national parks or something, like even even using feeders and, and having people cull deer for meat, but paying some money towards it, hey, you're getting meat at the, at the end of the day and that yep. money could go to something like stopping poaching. That's a win. That's a win for all hunters. And I know some people don't like the idea of paying for property or paying for access or paying to hunt. I don't really have an issue with it because that's like doesn't matter what – you pick a sport. You mentioned sport before. If you yep. want to play sport, you've got to pay money. You've got to have insurances. You have registration fees. You have clothing. You have referees fees. You have ground fees. They're all there. That's all part of it. That's what you chose. You chose to get into hunting. For me, it's not It's not something that's a free thing to do, nor no. do I think it should be because I want to see it sustained. I want to see it stay for the long run and be as ethical and legally, I guess, I guess it's just done legally. Like it's, yeah. uh, it, it infuriates me when this goes on and I can't imagine what a property owner would feel like knowing that someone's shooting on their property. They don't know who they are. They don't know how many they are. Imagine having young kids in the house. Like, I, you know, I you're a father, I'm a father. That to me just, I, I, I don't know how they do it personally. Yeah. I've got a few issues on my private access that I've got down down south from Sydney. Um, I found a couple of carcasses with the heads removed off them and he couldn't get access to his property for a while after the bushfires and the bridge, his bridge washed out and the only access was in through public land over out through the back and then back down into his property. Um, I've set up a few cameras now to try and catch who's been... Cause it, it's not a real known area, well known area, and it's pretty hard to get in up through the back. Uh, so they have to have a decent side, a decent four wheel drive, and know where they're going, sort of thing, to get into there. But now the bridge has been rebuilt. You've got to drive past other people who are there regularly at their house. But there's a house not too far from the property, and they've got a heap of kids, and they're always outside. They've got animals. These guys going in there just shooting willy nilly. It's yeah, it's, it's pretty sketchy. It's not something that even like. Me taking my young boys to state forest to go hunting, and you got yahoos running around in the bush, shooting up left, right, and centre. It's another aspect, safety aspect that you have to try and get over the line with the the wife as well. Like she's all for for what I do, but safety is the number one thing. It is one that definitely concerns me taking my kids out in the future and, yeah. and camping in a state forest when you have got people that do the wrong thing. 
it's yeah it's so sad that we have to think like that and i really do think it's a very small percentage of the hunting community oh, it is. and yeah. i wouldn't even actually put them in the hunting community to be nah, honest but we get tired with the same brush yeah, the, the people I associate with are, you know, ethical, good people and, and anyone that's not, I just cut ties with completely. Yeah. And that's just how I operate and I, I think the majority of people out there are the same. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you sort of, you find out, especially if you've spent a bit of time in the bush really, you find out how, how they are morally and it comes to what we do really quickly. Um, I had a few people ask if they could come on my last solo. I wanted to go solo, but... Um, I didn't really want to go into the bush with some strangers that I'd never met before because you're in there for four days. You've been pretty much close quarters the whole time. So I sort of said no to a couple of blokes, but it's the poaching side of things. It's it's really bad for hunters in general because that's all the public see. Um, and then we get painted. So it's hard enough the fact that we have firearms and people don't like firearms, the general public, let alone people just going around and just shooting stuff willy-nilly in the middle of the night. Yeah, it's. I don't know the answer. As I've said, I'd love for us to come up with something better and hunters to be a big part of the solution. But it is so difficult to be able to prove it. Like if you know someone yeah. poaches or has shot an animal over the fence, how do you really go about proving it unless you've got the audio and and yeah. um, have, you know of a conversation with it? Other than that, like you really can't do much about it. You can dob people in or you can raise the alarm. There is some, I know the DPI have how you can report it, but yeah. the reality is is that that one with Andrew, it sold it for me is that he claimed mental health and he got off. Yeah. Like there was nothing about that that was legal or any r- remote possibility of legal, but got pretty much off with a good behavior bond. Like what the hell? You know, yeah, exactly. it's got to be if they, you're caught poaching, you you hit and slapped with the biggest penalty possible because otherwise yeah. people aren't going to do it. And I know some people go, oh, we don't need a nanny state and things like that. But, well, look what's going on. Maybe we do sometimes. Like yeah. I don't think that if people can't do the right thing, there's got to be some consequence because if there's no reaction to their action, why are they going to stop? Well, the funny thing is like I've, I know of people who have lost their firearms licence because they've had a multitude of speeding fines over a short period of time. The firearms registry don't take into the fact that they might be under the pump a lot with work or financial issues, always rushing to and from work, got a lot of other stuff outside of work, but they're not just an idiot driving around fast all the time. They've caught, caught a couple of speeding fines going 10 kilometres over here or there. There's that many cameras these days. They're hidden. I'm not condoning speeding, but it's just something that happens, and they're quite happy to take a firearms licence of someone who does that, but someone who gets caught poaching, they might get a get a warning or get some of their gear taken off them and they're back out there the next night doing the same thing. Yeah, it seems silly. It does seem sometimes like the law-abiding firearm owner does cop the short end of the stick compared to people that don't do the right thing. It's very frustrating but, as I said, all you can do if you're if you're portraying hunting in a good light, being as ethical, responsible as possible and, and do everything by the books, then yep. – you know, you can't. You can go to sleep at night. You don't have to worry about you know running to the bins at night and who's going to get you or anything like that yeah. because you, you know, you, you got nothing to worry about. You're doing the right things. Exactly right. Let's talk about the preparation. Four days in the bush on your own in the middle yeah. of nowhere. How long did it take you to prep, and what were some of the key items that you were taking into the bush to to get you through it? Um, took me. I already had. I've already got a decent kit. Um, I can. I've done a few sort of overnight hunts and stuff like that. I've done a lot of stuff out of the back of the car. Um, the big things for me were my sleep arrangements, my accommodation, and food were the three big things I concentrated most of my planning around. Um, I did upgrade my sleeping mat. I wanted something a lot lighter, a lot smaller, but good R rating. So I went with the Cedar Summit, I think it is. Um, it's got a R rating of 6.9. Is that the – I've got the mid-range one, not the fully insulated. I've got the half-insulated version. Yeah, the, with the three-and-a-half, I think oh, it yeah, is think R so. rating. Oh, yeah. I bought it a long time ago. It's bloody brilliant, and the little hand pump yeah. is so good. Yeah. Well, this one come with the, the actual bag that you store it in. It's got the little pump they can push the air into, and it probably only took – 
30 seconds, 40 seconds to pump it up. Uh, I did work out after the first night, you do have to get it pretty nice and taut um, to make it work. Uh, but great little bit. I think it's the XT, I think it might be called, but it's got a really high R rating because I'll, I'll be using it in New Zealand. It wasn't really the R rating I was looking for. It was just the comfort level and the, the size of it. Uh, with my tent, Brett and I, who I'm going to New Zealand with, we're looking at sharing a tent. Well, he was looking at getting the Stone Glacier, uh, the new Stone Glacier two-man tent. I managed to find a Kuyu Mountain Star, uh, brand new in the package on, I think it might have been Marketplace, for a lot less than you could get them on the sales and everything, plus the shipping fees. Still in the plastic, not even the pegs had been taken out, put in the dirt. I picked that up really cheap and I thought, well, for the price of it, test this one, see how it goes. Um, and I was really impressed with that thing. That was super quick to set up. One of the, one of the cool little features I've seen in it was it took me by surprise. First night, laying in the tent, uh, got off the phone, the missus was about to go to sleep, and I had my head torch on, and I turned my head torch off. Then all of a sudden there's this glowing sheep head, the Kuiyu symbol, and it lit up the tent. So it was like a bioluminescent paint in the Kuiyu um, sheep head, and because the head torch charged it up, it actually gave me enough light to see what you're doing inside the tent. Yeah, that's cool. It was a great little feature. It was a cool little feature. I'm like, wow. So I ran a rank better to make this thing. This thing's awesome, this little glow-in-the-dark feature. It's something small, but it's those little things that you just go, wow, that's that's a nice little innovative little touch. And the fact that it didn't have the actual walls inside of it, the walls were the vestibule, and then you just had like a mesh wall on each side, zips on both sides, zips on both of the vestibules, and it was Oh, it was quite windy, and this thing, as long as you pulled it down nice and taut, there wasn't any wind coming up underneath the vestibules. It was a very comfortable little system. I think it's going to be quite cosy with two of us in it, uh, but we're going to take another fly to sort of put out our gear and kitchen and cooking sort of area, and that'll be just practically just for sleeping, I'd say. Um, I'm not looking forward if we do get bad weather <laughs> and spending three days in such close quarters together, but Brett and I have We've done a fair bit of hunting together, so I don't think we'll have too much too much uh, issues being in the same little tiny tent together for a couple of days. So, yeah, that was a cool little feature that I and it's it's really quick and easy to set up. There, it's got two poles that sort of curve over the top of one another, peg it all down, then it's got one pole that goes through the middle just to pop it up. It's got some little air vents at each end. It's a really cool little bit of kit. You can see why QU sell the gear they sell, um, and they get the reputation they do because they just everything's just right. Everything's just done right with their gear. Even the pack that I that I tested, the only thing I could find wrong with it was the fact that if you didn't have anything cinched right down really tight, the frame and the bag move against each other and creak a bit. So it'd be hard to – I found it sort of when I'm stalking, when I had the pack on without all the gear in it, it did creak around a bit. But I've just got some big patches of double-sided tape I'll be able to put in, put it in and just stop that little bit of movement just to stop that squeak. Other than that, I could not fold it. It carried the weight really well. It was balanced. You could talk, cinch it right down and get it all nice and tight. The padding was quite good on it. I couldn't order the Kuyu gun sling or the gun hoof because for some reason you can't order those things getting shipped to Australia Some because it's related to firearms. Really weird. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I tried to order. I'm like, why won't this come through? And they're like, we have to get someone in America to send it to them, and then they'll send it to us, post it to us, normal post. Uh, but I used a Stony Creek sort of gun uh, scabbard and pushed up through one of the straps, and I could actually pop it off, slide it out, and without taking the pack off. So I could actually get to my rifle without having to take the pack off, um, which I thought was a pretty cool little way to be able to sort of get it off if you needed to get a shot away, um, if you were sort of packing in or packing out or walking around with it on your, on your back. and. Food was a big thing for me. Um, I've tried the dehydrated meals. I used to use them a fair bit. Uh, I went with uh, on-track meals. These things are great. They're undehydrated, um, so you don't have to worry about taking extra water to add to them to, to get them prepped up. You can eat them cold straight out of the bag. So I just had them with a couple of packs of Uncle Ben's. I got the the Meat Lovers 4-pack just to see how it went. So it had like a coconut and ginger chicken one it had a bolognese casserole and uh what was the other one i had but they are uh, the green uh thai curry and they were great they were big 
with our big servings, I think they were 250, 300 gram servings and a bit of rice, um, and they tasted great. They were just easy to prep. I just took a little titanium fry pan on my jet boil, quickly heated it up. It took maybe a minute, uh, 90 seconds to heat it up, bit of rice in it, and away you go. There's your, there's your dinner done, nice and quick and easy. My breakfast, I've got my tried and true little Uncle Toby's one minute oats, a bit of milk powder and some dried fruit in a little Ziploc bag, just doing my little portions up in the morning, put it in a little little um, bowl, bit of hot water in it, put your boots on, put your gear, get ready, and then you just have that just before you're about to hit the tracks and it gives you great slow release energy, can warm you up in winter and it's just nice and quick and easy, it's cheap. Then throughout the day I carry uh, little back seal packs of my Samba jerky. Um, jerky is some of the best stuff you can have during the day. It's, it's, it fills you up, it gives you good energy, and I just love eating it as well. Um, I've got dog and gun Samba coffee as well, a couple of those during the day. They're just doing it right, those guys. Coffee tastes great. Nice little simple system if you've got your jet boil. That was pretty much my food, and hydration was a big thing for me as well, and electrolytes because I knew it was going to be warm. So I ran the, I think it's the peak performance hunting uh, hydrolyte packages. So like a recovery, uh, replenish, refuel, um, electrolyte mix. And you could really notice it. Like usually after a couple of days hunting, your body starts getting sore, joints are getting sore, it's harder to get out of bed. Never had an issue with these things. And I was, I was drinking a lot of water. I was probably going through six to eight litres of water a day. Um, and I have one of those sort of mid-morning. You're supposed to only take one a day. Day two, after I got back to camp at about 10 o'clock at night, after a long walk back, I was sweating, sweating bullets. It was so hot, even after nightfall. I had an extra one of those, and the next morning I was fine. Got up, I was fine. And I had to track out some pretty heavy country too that, that night. But, yeah, that was pretty much what I sort of concentrated my setup on, um, was the, my, my sleeping arrangements, my accommodation and my food yeah i think sometimes people oversee the food part and the electrolyte part and oats are perfect for that low gi or low glycemic index that slow release yeah. throughout as opposed to those high gi foods that you know might be high in sugar but they it's a it's a quick burn and then you, yeah, you're and slumping down. again yeah it's not that constant nice release where you're feeling good for the whole time it's more like that roller coaster or a yo-yo being yeah. up and down so that's something yeah. to consider on those trips and those longer adventures uh, again I've, I've done some hike throughs and things like that multi-day hikes and that's what we used to be very focused on because you do need yeah. a lot of water you, you sweat you do need that electrolyte hit to get that back into the body yeah. all the water's not getting absorbed as much as it can be or should be so that then can lead to some issues so it's interesting um i haven't heard of the one you spoke about just then so i'll, I'll have to look it up peak performance it's from nz those guys looked after me heaps because i ordered a couple of weeks before i went away and i was watching i was tracking it and it just wasn't leaving Auckland. I'm like, so I sent sent them an email, and they were really responsive. Um, they said, "Well, when's your trip?" I said, oh, "I've got another week or so." They go, "Oh, we don't want to risk it. We'll get one of our Australian suppliers to directly send it to you." And they organised all that, and it took a couple of days. I'm like, it probably should be here if it's coming from somewhere in Australia. I live in Sydney, so it's not really too far out of the realms to get it there within three or four days. And I was a bit worried, and. Um, I got up one morning, I checked my emails, I'm like, oh, they've refunded my money. Have they just left me left me in the lurch here and just give me my money back and just didn't worry about me? I'm like, nah, surely not. So I sent, sent Lee another email. I'm like, um, so what's going on? Why'd, why'd you refund my money? She goes, oh, well, we really want to make sure you're, you're happy with our product, so we refunded your money and you'll still get your stuff. And it actually arrived at 11 o'clock on Wednesday morning and I left at about 2 o'clock Wednesday afternoon. They got oh, to just, kind of just tight. in time. <laughs> it was kind of tight, but it was a great little little gesture to to, to refund my money and but also supply them because they're not cheap. Like I think the twenty pack was about sixty four NZ dollars, which isn't too much off the Australian dollar at the moment. Um, but well worth the money. 100%. I'll be definitely buying plenty of that stuff. It was great. I've been severely dehydrated and hospitalised before, and it's not a nice feeling. When I was younger, no. I did a um, – I think it was like a 30, 35K run 
and it was the middle of summer and it was just, it was a slog and I didn't have enough water. I didn't take enough water and I went downhill pretty quickly. So it is one of those things to be really super cautious of. And sometimes you, you, there's the tipping point. If you go a little bit too far, you're in a world of hurt and, you know, it's hard to get back. So it, it should be forefront of mind to make sure you're keeping as hydrated and fueled as possible to make sure that the trip's not going to be ruined by something going wrong. Yeah. Well, I, um, I ran the Sawyer inline filter system. So there's a couple of pouches in the pack, nice little inline filter. They've got a backwash little pump as well. So when it starts getting pogged up, and I did a bit of research because I've got live straws. I've got the little the actual bottle, but it's hard to actually get the water out of the bottle once it's in there. You have to either suck it out or, or um, yeah, it's it's quite difficult. So I found these little ones where you just you can either squeeze it out of the bottle, or you can drink it directly straight out of the filter, and I found it really useful. It sort of got blocked up on the last day a little bit, did a bit of backwash, and away it went. Um, so each morning. Um, I'd get down to the creek lines, I'd refill my three litre pouch in my pack, I'd fill the two, I'd fill another two litre bladder I had in my pack and then the two little one litre pouches. And that was enough to keep me going throughout the day. And then if I was anywhere near water before I was heading back out that night, I'd just top everything up, uh, make sure I drank plenty of water on the way out, drank another probably litre, litre and a half at dinner. Uh, before I went to bed, then I had enough the next morning to get me through the first session till about lunchtime and enough to do breakfast and a coffee. And then I'd, I'd have to track back down to the water again. Yeah, it's when summer comes around. Well, I know we're not in summer at the moment, but we're starting to ramp up heat wise. I tend to go a little bit off hunting and start mm-hmm. to focus a bit more on fishing just because yeah. heat meat spoilage you know there's just a few things there that make it a bit more difficult especially i i do most of my hunting on public land so it's one of those things so i can understand where you're coming from from that wanting to fill up i I run the life straws they're brilliant bits of gear i've got both the bottle and just the straw itself but you are right it is very difficult to siphon that water out of the bottle or through the filter system and then be able to use it in your you know whether it be your bladder system or you know, however you're going to use it and then, you know, put your electrolytes in or, or make your coffee or, or meals, whatever it might be. So it is that sort of tricky trying to get the right bit of gear and, and it's trial yeah. and error, isn't it? Sometimes you just it get is, something and go, oh, I like that or I don't like that as much and I don't like that for this reason and, yeah. you know, it, it's one of those things and everybody has their own sort of personal preference. Yeah. Mate, what about you? Summer's coming up. Do you keep hunting the whole way through? Do you start to switch it up a little bit? Oh, 100%. Um, traditionally, I'm sort of done with hunting usually by now. Um, I do have a little chittle hunt coming up soon, just before Christmas. Um, I've never chased them before. I've been given an opportunity to try and chase them on a bit of private land. Uh, but that'll probably be my last hunt for the year. I love my fishing. I love my spear fishing. I got my boat back on the water end of last year, and I think I've put about 160, 170 hours on it since then. Um, I take my boys fishing, I take my mates fishing, do a lot of offshore fishing. So, yeah, it's that time of year. We've got a van down at Ulladulla we've got access to that we go down. Last year, I think I, I fished 10 days straight down at Ulladulla. Got some nice snapper and squid and didn't do too much diving. Uh, water quality was pretty bad last year down there. Uh, but this year, because I used to do a lot of spear fishing, used to be in the comp scene on the board of the USFA, I sort of went by the wayside when I started just concentrating on hunting over the last seven or eight years, got right back into it. But definitely want to get back in the water. I love the water. Um, and considering I nearly drowned when I was 18, I wouldn't get back in the water until I was about 25 uh, when my mates who dived, one of my best mates, Tommy, he got me into spear fishing. Uh, we we're out on the boat one day and he's like, I'll jump in the water. I'm just going to go grab some craze. I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy just to fish on the boat. Um, he's like, what, what are you scared of the water? I'm like, no, 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 that's no, fine. I just want to fish. He goes, you're scared, aren't you? I'm like, give me your buddy with it. Give me your weight belt. And uh, we've jumped in the water. And because Tommy's a little bit larger than me, that's a bit more buoyant. He nearly sent me to the bottom with his weight belt. Uh, could have tore his head off that that day. But continue to have a little bit more of a dive that that afternoon and he's like oh do you want to come night diving for craze tonight i'm like are you serious you, you actually do that he goes yeah i'm like well 
can't really turn back from here. So I went for that dive that night and then I was hooked. That's all I did. That's all Tommy and I did for about eight years straight. Every weekend we'd be driving up the coast or down the coast. We'd be comp diving or we travelled to Niue over in the South Pacific. I've done New Zealand. Um, I've done a couple of coral sea trips. Um, I got shown by a lot of really good spiros in the community really quickly. Um, so I learnt really fast and I shot some really good fish. I love being underwater. Uh, I just wish I'd sort of, I want to spend a bit more time doing it, but it's not not as easy to just throw your gear on and go jump in the water, especially around Sydney. It's a bit hard to find fish um, as opposed to travelling up or down the coast a few hours. But the, there's plenty of craze there. We use, our usual spots aren't really producing over the last couple of years. But, yeah, I'll be definitely be in the water or on the water plenty um, over summer this year and leading into next year. Mate, there's some cracking spots down there. We had a caravan down there growing up in Brill Lakes, yep. so I did a nice, lot of yep. uh, lot of spearing around Wairo and Burrow Rocks, off uh, taking the boat out off the off the rocks out there, and yep. up near Lighthouse and things like that. Some great, you know, that channel there in Lighthouse. Just uh, yep. oh man, there's some good fish and and whatnot. You get in there when the pelagics are coming through, and it can yeah. be just on. So some uh, great dive spots but yeah that, that was one of the things with the diving for me was just a I didn't like diving alone so you know you yeah. always have to sort of have a mate and, and whatnot then the conditions and you know you can get in the water visibility's crap and then you're sort of like well <laughs> what's the point I can't see you know two three meters ahead of me I'm not it's, it's not conducive to good fishing so it's yeah. uh yeah it's just one of those tricky ones eh? it's uh, it is so much fun though like it's it is. I'll be getting back out a fair bit over summer into the water and having a dive, which is good. I'm looking forward to it. So hey, we'll get you out in the boat. I'll take you out, mate. Oh, sounds understand. good. Yeah. My brother just got back from an eight day trip with my best mate as well. They went up and dived off um, Rockhampton. They went out to a couple of reefs off there. Yeah, man, yeah, they got onto some good fish and the diving. I was going through his GoPro for him the other day and just, oh, crackers. A lot of sharks. A lot, a lot of sharks, of sharks yeah. but some really good spots to dive and they shot some great coral trout and things like that. Yeah. I think it was coral trout. Yeah. I just got into the Wahoo, got into some tuna, like just had an absolute blast and brought plenty of fish back. So I was, I was a bit jealous because I was uh, I was asked to go on that one. I was like, oh, eight days. Oh, I'm trying to plan this for hunting and, and it just, you know, it's uh, with, the, with the little ones, it's hard to get to everything you want to do, you know. It it's is. sort of like it that is. balancing act and what's going to be a bit more important. So it is what it is. That's part of life, isn't it? Yeah. Well, my boys are getting to the age now where they're, they're tagging along now and uh, they're getting right into it. So it, it does make it a bit easier to get it over the line and tell them this is going to go fishing. I'm just going to take the boys fishing or I'm going to take the boys hunting. So it's a little bit easier because she gets her time to herself and um, the boys get to get out in the bush or out in the nature and get them off those bloody screens. Mate, it's key. It's, um, you know, one of the things I think is really important. I know, uh, shout out to Cody Gear and he, um, you know, Australia's number one podcast guest, but <laughs> he uh, messaged us the other day with a uh, this damn bow shooting game where you can get it's uh, virtual reality and it's hunting yeah. and it's it concerns me that it will start to be for a lot of people that's super convenient and easy. And if you look at the track record of people, as soon as something becomes easier, they tend to take that option. And that worries me that a lot of people will go, you know what, oh, it is hard to drive four hours to go hunting as opposed to just flipping the switch. And a lot of people will continue to hunt. I get that. But yeah. I can see the new generation coming through because, you know, you look at some people's journey, especially on public land, it could be years before yeah. they take a deer. Whereas if you're playing these games, I'm pretty confident that you're going to be getting one pretty quickly. That's what video games are. They're that yeah. quick instant gratification for people. Yeah. And that does concern me. And we were having a bit of a chat about that because it sounds awesome for practice, but I yep. can, you know, I can see that if you were doing it for practice side of things, great. But I could also see people doing that as the first time and not being in love with the the lifestyle, as you called it before. Yeah. You know, if they're going away for four days like you did, slogging up and down and there's no payoff in the sense of an animal, well, yeah. you know, I jump online five, ten minutes from getting home and I could be on there for an hour, shoot something, oh, it feels great, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it, it concerns me the way sometimes tech like that could go yeah. potentially. Yeah. yeah, Mate, that's cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on. Before we wrap up, um, is there any sort of tips for people looking at getting down to the high country and, and doing a bit of a solo backpack hunt? One of the big keys is don't 
be overwhelmed by the terrain. I remember my first trip when I went down there. I went down with a very seasoned hunter that they used to do trips where they'd go drop stuff in during the during the summer and then backpack in for two weeks at a time um, into their reserves and it was very daunting, especially the drive. We go up there, go, this is some steep country. Don't get overwhelmed by the country. Just take it at your own own pace. You're not going to see all of it. It's it's a massive that high country, is some of the greatest greatest part of Australia, and you've only got to find one catchment and just spend spend some time in that one catchment. There's going to be animals in there. It's just a matter of slowing down and with Samba. I've said it to everyone um, that asked me about hunting samba, slow. Just take it slow. You cannot move too fast through the bush. They're just too weary, too switched on to movement, nice and slow. I take a couple of steps, two or three steps, then I'll glass, a couple more steps, and then I'll glass. It's something that they'll almost wait for you to stand on them before they'll jump up. If they're better, it's another thing. Then once they get up and they honk you, you're not going to forget that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that I remember the first time I got honked, I was hunting down in South Moragal before the ballot, before they had the ballot. So I got given a really good spot down there and I'd seen a cracker fellow, but he went over into the private property, so I let him go. And I was walking back to camp at night and there was a few of us in there camping and there was this almighty noise and I'm just like, made my heart stop. And then I'm just like, what the hell was that? And I couldn't wait till I got back to signal to ring one of my mates. It was a bit more experienced in hunting. I'm like, man, this this noise. I don't know what the hell it was. Was it a dog? Was it a bird? Or he goes, oh, it's too loud for a bird. He goes, did it sound like a big, like a honk? I'm like, yeah. He goes, it's a samba. I'm like, and that was, <laughs> well, yeah. Once you hear that couple of the first honk, um, yeah, you you never forget it. But yeah, biggest tip is Victorian high country. Don't be overwhelmed. Be well prepared. A good set of boots. Because up and down that terrain, you need boots that are gonna that are gonna serve you well. Feet are one of the biggest things you have to look after in, in the bush, let alone in the Victorian high country. So they're probably my my biggest tips: your feet, don't get overwhelmed, and slow down. Love it. Thank you for coming on and, and sharing tonight, uh, mate. Wish you all the best over the summer chasing some fish, and next yep. year when you hit up NZ. So. Thanks for uh, coming on and I know our listeners would have got a fair bit out of tonight. So really appreciate it, Rick. Thank you for having me on. Uh, Mate, do you want to tell everybody about the um, Samba page, what it's called, where they can find it? Yeah, check it out on Facebook. It's called the NSW, New South Wales Samba Hunters page. Um, It's grown really quickly. We've got some merch available, got some pretty cool shirts, some stickers, got some hats coming along as well. Uh, Jump on there. Whether or not you shot a Samba or you've seen them or you haven't seen them or you want to learn about them, it's actually a really good community at the moment. There's a lot of feedback. We've got a meet-up next on Thursday. I think it's the 6th of December. Don't quote me on that one. Out at Crossroads Hotel in Kasula. We're going to have a bit of a feed and a few, few bevies and talk everything about Samba. All right, guys. I hope you've got a lot out of tonight. Thanks for joining us and we will catch you next time. Bye for now. If you have a topic, guest, question, or any gear that you want to hear about on the podcast, shoot us an email, australianhuntingandbeyond at gmail.com. Alternatively, find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All the links are in the show notes. If you haven't already, make sure you give us a review and subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you next time.